Roman. Yes. What up, my friend? How are you? What's going on, Rachel? You drinking that that 9 p.m. coffee? <laughs> uh, tea, tea with lemon and honey always, because I'm Zoom oh, okay. meetings all day. Uh -huh. I know you're an animal. Always go, go, go. You got so much going on. Thank God for that, right? Mm-hmm. Absolutely, especially after the last couple of years that we've all had. Wow. Listen, thank you so much for joining us today and uh, for, you know, offering to just drop all these bombs of wisdom around credit and funding and money. We all need more of it. We got to figure out how to crack this code. I'm just learning here with you all watching right now. Trust me, uh, uh, used to have amazing credit. And uh, then I decided to go on this uh, wild uh uh, entrepreneurial ride. So uh, I've been actually dreading this call with Roman. Don't ask me any personal questions today. But I will say that I have seen the amazing things that you've done for Jalen and his credit. Um, and, you know, in the midst of chaos, when the world was upside down, he was like, I'm going to fix my credit. I'm going to make this happen. And you know what? He was really able to do it and able to get economic relief loans, cars, uh, uh, finance new equipment. So it's possible for everyone. I know that. And you're the guy to go to. So give me a little background. Why credit victory? Why funding victory? Uh, Rachel, I appreciate this so much and for welcoming me back to the Music Entrepreneur Conference. Uh, we've uh, been rubbing shoulders for the last couple of years, right? And doing some projects together which I'm very excited about with you and Jalen. From the moment I met the two of you, I knew you both were very different. Uh, you had a dream, you ran with it, and now we see what it's turned into, right? Music Entrepreneur is global. Everybody knows about it, hears about it. It's no longer, hey, what's what's that? The, the business of music, and that's what it is. And the beauty about the music of business or the music or the business of anything involves credit. I always say credit runs everything. You know, people say uh, America runs on Dunkin'. That is not true. America runs on <laughs> credit, folks. It's that three-digit number that controls our lives. And the most important part is we have the right to control that number, right, as to what that number is, just by the way we change our lifestyle. You know, like you were saying, um, you're, you were dreading this conversation. I was looking forward to it. Uh, as a follow-up to, you know, being at the conference a few years ago. And the reason for it is because people always ask, uh, you know, what is the secret, right? You have so many people talk about credit. There really, really is one secret. It, it is, it, and this is the only one you need to remember. And I'm going to reveal it up front. People always say, hey, if you watch the whole podcast or you listen to my whole show, at the end, I'm going to reveal X, Y, Z, right? Well, hey, if you want to stop watching here, you can. The secret is real simple. Don't have any late payments. Don't have any late payments. And why is that? The reason is the negative of credit is so much more dangerous and powerful than the positive of credit. And what I mean by that is, and I'll give you this little example, is if you have a late payment on your credit card, right, it takes only 30 days to be late on your payment and your score can drop 50 points or more wow. just with one late payment. But take the other side of the equation. If you make your payment on time on one given month and you're within the 30 day range, your score doesn't go up 50 points. So there's that balance, right? The negative is so much harsher than the positive. And mm -hmm. why do I bring that up right up front? To let you know that credit is a constant work. It's a constant road under construction. It's a lifestyle. It's like working out. You constantly got to be thinking about, am I doing the right things? Am I taking the right steps to maintain my credit and to raise my credit score? And definitely shouldn't be doing anything to drop my credit because that can just happen with one late payment, right? One missed payment mm -hmm. and boom. And it's so hard to climb back up from there. So I want to start off with that. That's the secret. So I hope you'll listen to the rest of this because there's going to be some really interesting things. <laughs> but why credit victory? Why funding victory? To go back to your question. So I personally am not embarrassed to say it, have been impacted by poor credit. I made some poor decisions when I was younger and I had very poor credit. Also some unfortunate business dealings with some unfortunate business partners that have led to poor 
the to bad credit. So now climbing out of that black hole, as I call it, which was very hard, especially, you know, today you go on YouTube, there's thousands of videos. And you know what? Everybody wants to be a credit expert. And by no means am I looking to say, hey, I'm going to give you golden nuggets you're not going to hear anywhere else. But I'm going to give you the ones that are important. I'm going to tell you today what you could do every day, simple things that can change your credit, the way you think about credit and the way you could raise your credit score. Simple things, nothing complicated, and the way you mm -hmm. could change your mindset over it. So that's important. And uh, because I was personally affected by, by bad credit and poor credit, I figured, and it probably sounds like the typical story, right? I had bad credit, and I thought, hey, I could do this for other people, and that's exactly what happened. I learned the industry. I learned what's, what you can do, what you can't do, and I actually personally restored my own credit. I couldn't afford to pay a company at that time to restore my credit. That's a fact. And, you know, through the books that were available and, and trying different strategies, I was able to increase my credit score. I don't want to start misrepresenting numbers and saying, hey, I had 400 credit score and I went to 750 in 60 days because that's not realistic. You know, one of the things I want to talk about, and I did, I made some notes. And the reason for it is credit is a topic you could talk about literally for hours. At least I can. And I don't want to be all over the place, so I wanted to really make some bullet points for myself about the things that I want to share today. So once I personally went through that and it affected my life, it affected my family, and it took a while to get out of there, right? Because I didn't have anyone holding my hand. I didn't know what worked. It was trial and error. But when I did learn, I could tell you one thing. It's one of the things in your life that when you have, when you get out of a situation from having bad credit, to better credit, to great credit, your whole self-confidence changes about you. The way you walk, the way you breathe. And I can tell you that even with my conversations with Jalen, right? Um, I didn't bring it up, you did, so I'm glad, so we could talk about it. When Jalen literally, when we helped him with what we did, and he started educating himself, I, I even he even spoke differently, right? I remember that call when he called me, and he was like, Roman, oh my goodness, this work, my score went up, now we're doing these things, and I got approved for that, I got approved for that. It's just a whole different level of excitement. You walk differently, talk differently, right away opportunities open up for you, right? And that's one of the things I love about credit. It's one of those things that really impacts you in a positive way. You know, mm -hmm. when you can walk into any store, you know, to and you can apply for credit for a car, for an apartment, for a home, for a mortgage, whatever it is, and know that you're going to get approved, you're not sitting there thinking, uh, you know, I hope not, right? It's it's just you carry yourself in a different way. You feel better about yourself, right? And mm -hmm. and those are the things I'm going to talk about today. What do you do on a daily basis, on a weekly and monthly basis that can make you feel that way, right? There are some things that are out of your hands, which hopefully with our help at some point, maybe down the road, uh, we can we can help you all out depending on the situation you're in. But there's definitely things you can do every day. So uh, fast forward, I decided and I said to myself, you know what, I really want to build something different and, and different in the sense of I don't want to be every, uh, just like every other credit restoration company, right, and helping people rebuild their credit. I want there to be something where they know and they feel confident that they're actually paying for something that makes sense. And that's why I launched Credit Victor. And maybe towards the end, if we have some time, I'll talk about what makes us different than the other guys, right? To mm -hmm. how do we stand out in the crowd? Um, I, I'd love to talk about that. And as we started building Credit Victory and we started helping people all over the country restore their credit, we found one, one common denominator that when people fix their credit, what do they want next? They want money, they want capital. They want access to capital. People literally would say, hey, oh my goodness, I'm at this core, I'm gonna try to now apply for an auto loan a uh, mortgage, an apartment, I want to get a credit card. But the problem with that is people get too excited too fast. And if they don't do it right, they end up back in the same situation where they started. So what we started seeing was we were helping clients re rebuild and restore their credit six to nine months. And then a year or a year and a half later, we would follow up with them maybe for referrals or just to see how they're doing. And we started finding a lot of people that we helped ending up in the same or worse situation. 
And we said, something doesn't make sense here, right? What, where are we dropping the ball? Well, we're dropping the ball where we're not continually educating our clients. And number two, we've seen all these people run out, right? It's like Black Friday when the doors open. Everybody goes for those 30 televisions, right? They just all run for it. It's the same thing. The gates open, the horse is out of the stable. I've got credit. Oh my God, I'm over the 700 Woo! Yeah. Woo. Let's apply for the credit cards. Let's go buy this. Let's go that. Let's no, get a Let's don't, get a mm -hmm. don't do that. Please don't do that, right? There's ways to go about doing it, right? It's all steps. It's all steps. Because you worked so hard to get out of that hole, you want to at least try to maintain it. Yeah. So we said to ourselves, we found all these people that are going and applying for these loans that they either don't qualify for or really not for them at that time. What should we do? And I said, hey, you know what? We need to bring this full circle. Not only should we be restoring people's credit and educating them along the way, we should also be able to help them with securing capital, getting into funding programs that make sense. And that's why we launched Funding Victory, the sister company to Credit Victory. Because it really is, you know, when you overcome um, bad credit or poor credit, and be, it really is something that you're victorious over. It, it really is a victory. It's like, yes, it's such a good <laughs> feeling. And it's the same thing with funding. When you go to a bank and the bank turns you down, because the bank, you know, they have their blinders on. They only see things one way. They, they're in a box. And we can put you into one of our alternative funding programs, and you can get access to capital just when two weeks ago, the bank told you, no, it's the same feeling. It's like, yes, you know what? There are options for me. So that's why we created, we build that bridge from credit to funding. And we have kind of more control over the entire process. And our motto at Funding Victory is money that makes sense. Because money has to make sense. You can't just go borrowing just anywhere, paying, you know, uh, very, very high interest rates because it's going to get you right back into the same situation. Mm -hmm. You know, when you're making money and your credit's great and everything's good and dandy, life's wonderful, right? We have no problems with paying high interest rates, even if we have to. But we all learned in these last two years with, God, with COVID that rea the reality in life can change in a snap of a finger. And we have yep. to be prepared. So that's the long, short answer of how we got to credit victory and funding victory. I'm very proud of what we're doing, right? Because we're a company with heart. And I think Rachel and Jalen can vouch for that. They know me a little bit. And, and I try to do everything with being mindful of the individual of how I wanna be treated, how I want my family to be treated. And this is not all just about money. It's about really helping people through this dark time in their life to navigate through this system. And it is a system. And believe me, we know this system well. It's a what we've created a very well-oiled machine as to how it works and how to with uh, implementing good behaviors, good lifestyle changes, you can always maintain good and or great credit. So I hope that answered your question. Yeah, for sure. And and you know, this whole conversation also is not necessarily for everyone or thinking that everyone out there maybe has bad credit, but like we were talking about before, just not knowing enough how to build up credit, yes. both on the personal side and then the business side as well. So as an artist, as a small agency or indie label or whatever, you know, there's those two things to think about is like, how do I actually build up business credit? Do you want to talk about the difference maybe in the two? Yeah, absolutely. I'm, I'm glad you brought that up, Rachel. First, you know, we're here at the Music Entrepreneur Conference, the business of music, right? And it is a business at the end of the day. And every artist should look at themselves as a business, right? You know, music is definitely the language of my soul. I love music. Jalen and Rachel know how much I love music. It's part of my life. I love it as much as I love credit, and I could talk about it. <laughs> but, you know, musicians today have to look at themselves like music entrepreneurs, like a business and a bit and they are a business and one of the things and one of the most important things about business is creating business credit is building a credit for your company separate from your own personal credit right and that's a long winding conversation there's a lot of options there but just so you all of you out there who are listening understand that the moment you become an artist that and you start thinking that you are an entrepreneur which you are and you are a business that you need to start building your own business credit. 
And again, there's a lot of information out there on, on the internet, and we definitely, and our team can help you with that, with free resources, and there's some paid resources that we have to help you build your business credit. But once you build your business credit, the amazing thing about it is it's separate from your personal credit. It does not impact your personal credit. So you can be dealing with, and like Rachel said, you may not per se have bad credit, but you may not have the greatest credit. You might be somewhere in the middle, but you can start building your business credit, which is completely separate from your personal credit. And you can actually start build yourself great business credit while you're working on your personal credit. And the two have nothing to do with one another. And, there, and you can self-fund your entrepreneurial journey and your business or whatever it is that you're looking to do for your music. Because it's hard to get money out there for artists. You know, I, I know that firsthand. I have a lot of artists that come to us and ask us about, you know, getting funding. But, you know, like anything else, any lender who's looking to lend is looking for collateral, right? You know, if I lend you money, what is it that you have that guarantees I'm going to get paid back, right? One of the things that people always ask me, well, explain to me what, you know, what is a credit score? What's a FICO credit score? And I try to always simplify it as much as I can, just for the average conversation. And I actually wrote this down today, and I have it here in front of me because it's the simplest way I can describe what a three-digit FICO score or credit score is. A three-digit number that tells any potential lender how, his, how you historically pay back your debts, right? Any lender wants to know if I'm giving you this money, how are you at paying it back? I need some kind of gauge, right? And that's mm -hmm. the gauge, it's that number. So um, entre just to go back to the question, entrepreneurs, music entrepreneurs should be really focused from the get-go as they're focused on, hey, you know, what's my genre of music? Who should I use for publishing? Who should I align myself as a, as, as a music producer? All the things that musicians think about. One of the things that should be at the forefront right from the beginning is thinking about setting up their business or their corporate entity, an LLC or an S-Corp, whatever their accountant advises them, and right away out the gate, building business credit. And, and as we build this relationship with all of you music entrepreneurs, we look forward to sharing that information with you and letting you know how you can do that on your own or with our help. So what do you think, I mean, uh, what's the first step for someone who is, you know, struggling a bit with their credit? Are there certain uh, sites they need to set up on to just kind of track where they're at? Like, where, where, what's the starting point? So starting point, my first um, golden nugget, as I want to say, and, and it really is a golden nugget, because this is really something that really changes the dynamic. So every time I walk into Starbucks or into the pharmacy or into the, and I see people using their debit card, I'm just holding my head saying, why are you doing that? And sometimes, you know, I'm a vocal guy. And, and you know, sometimes I just want to say something, <laughs> tap the guy on the shoulder, say, what are you doing? Right. He may have a perfect credit score. It doesn't make a difference. He shouldn't be using his debit card. Now you say, well, why? Well, just to backtrack on that, because right away, some people will be like, oh, wait, Roman, that's the wrong advice. Because um, you shouldn't be putting stuff on credit cards you can't afford. You're right. First, you shouldn't be charging anything that you don't have the money to buy in the first place. But think of it this way. You using a debit card is basically you saying, hey, I have the money in my checking account, and I'm giving you my money in my checking account. You're not doing anything for your credit, right, at that point. What you should do is... If you have the funds in your account, and let's say you're at Starbucks, you're, you're going to charge $10. Put it on a credit card instead. You know you have the money in the bank. That's why you're at Starbucks spending $10. Charge that drink and uh, scone at Starbucks for $10. Bucks, and then pay that credit card off with the money you have in your bank within seven days. Now, what did you do? You charge something on a credit card, you built some kind of history, and you paid that amount off within the 30 days that you needed to, to before your billing statement is generated. And you showed in good faith to the creditor, to the credit card companies, hey, I'm reliable. You, you let me use your credit. 
I spend $10 of it, I paid you back right away, right? Now, those that's a small little example. That's not going to be enough to go to the Mercedes dealership tomorrow and say, hey, I'm ready to sign and drive an S5 class. But those small changes in your daily behavior, you know, X amount of times that you use a, de a debit card daily. Let's say they say the average is five to seven times a day. So imagine five to seven times a day, 30, 30 days in the month, that's 200 transactions. So that's 200 transactions potentially you could be putting on your credit card and paying off. Do you know what that shows a lender or a credit card company? That, wow, this person is reliable. They, they do what they say they're going to do. We lend them money. They pay us back. So that's one simple trick that I tell everybody. Stop using your debit card. You can let, bring anyone on the show you want to talk to me on this. They could be a financial guru of 40 years. They're not going to dispute that, that there mm -hmm. is no benefit in using your debit card whatsoever because you're not building credit history for yourself, the history of how you pay off your credit card bills. So that's number one. Number two, pay more than once during your credit card billing cycle. So you have a credit card. You get a monthly statement. There's a due date on there. It's usually 30 days, right? And usually most people are like, hey, I have a due date. I'm, I need to make sure I make that one payment before my due date, which is a good way of thinking about it. Because again, I started this show off with, please, no late payments. That's the secret, right? That, that's what hits your credit the hardest. So if you make one more than one payment, there is an algorithm that these credit bureaus have to figure out what your credit score is. You know, how do they come up with this three digit number? And it's an algorithm that I can't explain to you and most people can't, right? It's like Google's algorithm, go figure it out. Yeah. Today you're ranked on number one, tomorrow you're number five and nobody knows how that happened. So it's a similar algorithm, but it's a little bit more predictable than Google is, right? Because there's five factors to that algorithm, which I'll talk about quickly. And what one of the things we know predominantly that is effective in um, hacking that algorithm legally to your favor is making more than one payment during a billing cycle. So I went to Starbucks, I charged on Starbucks, I went to the pharmacy, I charged the, I went to the cleaners. Let's say that day you spent $150 on your credit card. In within seven days, that's just my rule of thumb that I tell people. Within seven days, by the seven days, usually that amount already appears on your credit card statement. Go into your bank account the same way you were going to use with your debit card and send a payment to your credit card company and pay that off. Get into a habit of doing that every seven days. Right now, somebody might say, well, wait a second. Oh, my goodness, that's a lot of money. Well, number one, we're going back to the premise of you shouldn't be buying something that you don't have the money to pay for in the first place. So we, we are in agreement that you're only buying things that you have the funds to buy with, right? So every seven days is my rule of thumb and what I teach my team and what the team te teaches our clients. Um, if you can do every seven days, twice a month at least, you definitely wanna make more than one payment on your credit card within one billing cycle. One billing cycle is 30 days. Is so it just more than one? So it can be two, is this two the same as four, the same as eight, the same as if I paid it off every day that I used it? It's a good question. You know, no one really has the exact answer, but what I've seen, and we we kind of, you know, we do A and B testing, ABC yeah. testing. We've we've seen that over X amount of people, the ones that are paying more than two more than two times a month on their billing cycle, their score seems to go up incrementally without them doing anything else. Okay. So there must be something to it. And the point is this: you have the money right? So that's already not an issue. Then what? Then the, the difference between you making two payments or four is just a reminder. And we know in today's day and age, we could set our reminders and auto pay, and that's pretty simple. So I do every seven days. Everything I build the last seven days, I pay off on the seventh day. Now, paying off, here's another little trick, real small trick. Let's say you have $150 in balances due. Never pay a full 150 or pay like 148, leave like $2. Why? Some credit card companies, when you pay down your balance to zero, they don't report it on your credit bureau report. 
they feel it's like a waste. It's a zero balance. We don't have to report it. But you need them to report that you have a zero balance because it shows that, hey, he paid on time and he paid it all in full. So to offset that, another hack, we try to leave a dollar or two because if it's a, if it's anything over one penny, they have to report it. So that's really important. I can't tell you which cards do or not. Um, in the beginning, we try to make a list, but then we start, so Discover might do it and they stop. Amex did it, but they didn't do it. So I don't want any credit card companies saying, hey, why are we on this list? Overall, that's a good rule of thumb. Your interest on $2 balances are going to be really minute. Nothing, yeah. It's like nothing. But at least you know your balances will be reported to the credit, credit bureaus. And that's important because every credit card that you have, every uh, relationship with any lender you have for a mortgage, an auto loan, any credit card secured, unsecured, is reported to the credit bureaus. The credit bureaus are, you know, the three major credit bureaus. They are the ones that um, that gather all this data, that have these algorithms that uh, basically um, are are the ones that compute these credit scores that we all live by, unfortunately. Um, so that would be a, a small little hack there. Um, a lot of people make a mistake when they have a card, you know, because if you have multiple cards, sometimes you have that one favorite card. It gives you mileage points, Amazon points. So you, you don't use the other cards, right? So what happens? Some people, very often I see people call me and say, hey, I just closed my three accounts. I'm like, what did you do? You closed your three account. Why did you do that? They're like, oh, we don't use them. Really, you don't ever close any credit card accounts, even the ones that are unused, because it impacts your score negatively, right? So, and we know that to be a fact. So anything I'm telling you now is factual as far as how it affects the algorithm. And these are small things that every person could do. Like, hey, if you have credit cards you're not using, don't close them. But really what you should be doing is if you have five credit cards, you have that one favorite one, every 90 days, you should charge at least one item on that one card that you're not using frequently. It could be the Starbucks for $10 and then just paid off in seven days. It uh, prevents the credit card company from shutting down your account. It prevents from you uh, closing your own account because you think you're not using it. And also it keeps you being mindful of the fact that you have this additional credit card you should be using periodically. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's another point that's super important. Uh, number four is if you add the very minimum, no matter what's happening in your life. And again, I know COVID was an extreme circumstance in our life where so many people could not pay their credit cards. It was unfortunate. And thankfully, a lot of the cards were kind enough to offer forbearance programs and work with consumers. But hopefully we will never see that again in our lifetime is never, ever, ever miss at least your minimum payment. And I go a step further and it's not a big thing. If you can afford coffee on a daily, you can afford to pay an additional 10% above your minimum payment that you owe, right? Again, it shows in good faith. You never want to be, your credit profile never look, wants to be seen as by the lenders that you're going to be applying for more credit from that this, this person only pays the minimum payment. They're known to pay, Roman is known to only make a minimum payment. It doesn't look good for you on your history, right? Because then it allows the lenders in the future to think and really second guess if they want to lend you money. Um, so I always say, take your minimum payment and add 10%. If you're going through some rough times, you don't have the funds. So if your minimum payment's $50, tack on an extra five, which would be 10%, and send 55 that month. There's something to that which offsets the algorithm where it doesn't pull you into the category of this person only makes minimum payments. So that's another little trick that I often teach people. And these are, I think none of the things I say are complicated. None of the things require you to have a lot of money and none of the things really require you to spend a lot of time. I mean, you could literally make yourself a small list and just after a while, it just becomes second nature, right? And now I don't even touch my debit card when I go into any store whatsoever unless that retailer says we only take debit cards and in that case i pay with a debit card which is fine mm -hmm. okay but i don't make it a matter of habit 
Now, I did mention that I keep mentioning the word algorithm, right? What's this algorithm and what really contributes to this algorithm? How do the credit bureaus come up with this three digit number? So there's five important things. And this is it could be found anywhere on the Internet. I'll go over it quickly with you. And super, super important. Um, it's, it's like a pizza pie. It's cut into five slices. Two of the slices way bigger than the other three because these are the two main things that constitute what really comes up with this three-digit number called the FICO credit score. And number one, which makes up 35% of this algorithm, of this pie, it's the largest size of the pizza slice, the largest slice in the pie, and that is payment history. Do you pay on time? Do you pay on time? And I wanna talk about that on time payment for a second, because people hear 30 days but there's really two 30-day payments, and that's important to know. So do you pay on time? You have your credit card statement, and there's a due date on there. Let's say the due date is the 15th of December. If you miss that due date, the credit card most likely will charge you a late fee. That's one late fee. You're late because you didn't pay it on time. Now, that's not so terrible, though you should not experiment with that. It happens once in a while, life happens, but that 30 days doesn't really impact your credit score because it has not been reported to the credit bureau that you are, that you've paid late. And why is that? Because beyond the due date, you have 30 days before the next due date, right? So that would be January 15th, that you need to make that payment or at that point, you will be considered 30 days behind and 30 days late by the credit bureau, which then will be reported to the credit bureau as a 30 day late payment, which is where your credit score tanks 50 points, give or take. I've seen 70. I've seen, I think the lowest I've seen is like 35. And that's them being super kind. Okay. Mm -hmm. It's not a human being, it is an algorithm, it's all computerized, but go explain and go figure how they got to that number. So um, if you miss your credit card statement due date, I always advise calling the credit card, especially if it's your first or second time, and just have a you know human conversation with them. Hi, I'm Roman. I've with, been with you with X amount of years. You know what? Unfortunately, um, whatever happened, you know, just be honest with them and let them know. And usually they'll waive a first late fee. So they'll waive the late fee. That hasn't really affected you because those late fees could be pretty harsh. Some of them are 30, 40, and $45. And number two, you still have the chance to make up that payment before the next due date. So your due date was December 15th. You missed it. You were late. Let's say you called your credit card company. They dismissed it and gave you a courtesy credit. And now you still have until January 14th before you're considered 30 days late by the credit bureaus. You never want to be that late. That's where it starts impacting your score. I always tell, just like your landlord, if you miss your rent payment, God forbid, or your mortgage, your bank, they just want to make sure you're in communication with them. Your credit card company wants the same thing. They want the human aspect that they can reach you and you could speak with them. You always want to call and let them know what's going on. You want to let them know what life circumstances are. If you don't answer those annoying calls that I know come in five times a day, you're only hurting yourself. But if you just simply pick up and tell them, hey, this is what I'm going through, you know, with God forbid, it's a medical situation. And again, as we build the relationship with all you music entrepreneurs, and I'm sure Rachel and Jalen will give us the opportunity to uh, be in contact with all of you one way or another. You're not obligated to use our services. Just the, even if you need some free tips, free hints, we're happy to speak with you or send you information that's gonna help you, even information that you'll need when you call them to how to get a late payment removed, what to say to them, how to speak to them, okay? So those are important things. We wanna build a relationship with you all. We wanna bring value to you all. And that's one of the things we do at Credit Victory, genuinely. You know, when we, give, when we talk about our program and how it works, why I'm so proud of what we do, we don't have the typical system where we're billing clients monthly for our services, you know? We, are, we have a very, very unique model where you're only paying for results. And you know when I tell people that we have this dynamic, it really takes a lot of pressure off of people because so many credit repair companies out there, I don't even like to use the word credit repair, credit restoration companies, 
because we're, we're not needing to repair anything. They're, they're billing clients month after month, month after month, where some months you really don't see any results. And that may not even be the something that the company's doing or not doing, but the client's still being billed. And when the client mm -hmm. is dealing with a credit situation already and then having to pay every month, it makes it even more difficult for them. So we take that burden off of them. We take that risk off of them. We feel that we're, we're good at what we do and we're willing to show them that to the extent where only if we deliver results do we then charge you for our services. But we'll wow. talk about that at a later, later time and we're very proud of, of the program we have. So going back to that pie, that pizza pie, is again, the payment history, that's number one. So pay on time, try not to be late. At the very minimum, whatever you need to do, even if you have to borrow from someone, from a friend or a family member, to make one monthly payment, that minimum payment, not to be late, it is totally worth it than to impact your score by 40, 50, 60 points. Mm -hmm. Number two uh, is the second piece of the pie, the second biggest slice, it is the amount owed. Um, and what that means is, there is a threshold that the algorithm has as far as how much do they want you using from the monies that they allow you to borrow. So you have a credit limit on a credit card. Let's say it's $1,000. The rule of thumb is don't exceed 30% on any given month of that $1,000, which would be $300, right? You don't want to charge. So even if you charge six, if you charge six hundred dollars, for example, which would be sixty percent, even if you paid off in a week, there's record of the fact that you exceeded the thirty percent limit and you went up and above and literally doubled that, and you, you charge sixty percent of that credit. That already impacts you negatively, even if you paid off in full. So try to stay within that thirty percent unless my rule of thumb always I say is under ten percent. Under 10% allows you to have the best credit score you can have. Okay? okay. How do you how do you change that with just day-to-day -day, um, behaviors? Well, if you pay your minimum payment monthly and you pay your bills on time, three, four, five months in after you have a credit card, you can call them up and say, hey, I'd like to be considered for a credit increase. So if they increase your credit limit, let's say now to $2,000, then that 30% that you have, that threshold, allows you to charge more because now it's not 300, it's 600. So you always want to try to, month to month, call your various credit cards, speak with them, ask them if they can raise your credit limit, if you qualify for a credit limit increase. That also impacts you in a positive way. Number three, and I'll go through this quickly, um, how, much, how many items you have that are new credit? It's 10%. It's the smallest pie, uh, slice of the pie. How much new credit are you applying for? And this is the key with new credit. So a lot of people think, hey, you know what? I haven't applied for a credit card for a while. Let me apply for a card. And that might not be a bad thing because you want to increase your credit line, which gives you the opportunity to have more credit available to you. So your threshold, as far as the usage goes up as well, is how you apply for the new credit. So if you're applying for a new credit card and you get approved, the key to that and the secret is keep applying for new cards subsequently at the same period of time until you get denied for one. You apply for an Amex today, you got approved, apply for a Discover card the same day. Apply for a Visa card the next day. Because it's within a short period of time, it's only one inquiry because it's related to the same thing, only if you get denied. And once by the time you get denied, you might have got approved for four credit cards. At a thousand or two thousand credit limit, you might be have been able to secure eight or ten thousand dollar credit limit in one or two or three day period of time, and only got denied for the one card. So that's only one inquiry, okay? And we do that for a lot of our clients, and it, it really is. I really think it's one of the best hacks that most people don't know about. So mm -hmm. applying for numerous cards in a very short period of time until you get denied for one, then stop. Okay. okay? I like that one. Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, two, the last two, uh, you know, slices of the pie are number one is the credit mix. What type of mix of credit do you have? The credit, the 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 lenders don't want to see that you only have um, secured credit cards. You know, they don't want to see that you only have mortgage payments. They want to see an array of different things. They want to see you have an auto loan, a mortgage, a couple of secured credit cards, maybe a store credit card, 
like a Nordstrom, a Bloomingdale's, a JCPenney card. Um, those are things that are super important and the fact that you're paying each one of them. You know, there's installment loans, secure, and let me talk about secured and unsecured, right? Some people don't know the difference, which is just fine. Um, so what's, an un, uh, what's a secured credit card? When you're just starting out here, talking to the music entrepreneurs, just starting out, building their credit, don't have any credit. So you may not have bad credit, you just may have very little credit history. You may start out with a secured credit card. And we have a couple that we recommend, that we've vetted, that we've worked with, and are excellent, excellent partners that have done you know, wonders for our clients. Or you could simply go to your bank and say, hey, here's $500 or whatever amount's comfortable for you. You put that down as a deposit into your account and the bank gives you a credit card matching that same amount that you put down as a secured deposit. So now they give you a credit card with a credit line matching the amount of money you put into the account. So 500 security deposit, 500 secured credit card line. That's why it's called secured because you're securing it with the capital that you're giving them. You use that card, you pay it off on time. Two, three months later, you go in, you add a couple of hundred dollars. Now your credit line's a thousand dollars. Eventually, that builds credit, and for every card, it's different. It might be six months to a year, where now you would be considered for an unsecured credit card. Unsecured meaning the credit card companies now say, "Hey, this individual has proven to us." They're responsible. We trust them. We're now going to give them a thousand dollar credit line per se in unsecured credit. It's not secured by anything except the fact that they believe you're going to pay them back that you say, and they're now giving you an unsecured credit card. So that's the difference between the two. And lastly is uh, the last slice of this pie that makes up this algorithm is the length of credit history. How long have you had credit cards? And that's something we can't hack. <clears throat> you know, if you started building your credit at 18, hopefully, you know, by 20, you can have amazing credit. Uh, my middle daughter, who just turned 20, I started this, this journey for her when she was 18. She's not like, Dad, this is working exactly how you told me. My goodness. I started with 500 with a Capital One card, then we went to 1,000, then we went to 1,500, now she got another card. So this is a formula that works. When mm -hmm. there's no way to hack the time, that you, you know, in the length of time that you are building your credit. Just don't mess it up by doing foolish things, uh, which I've talked about before. So that's kind of how the algorithm uh, is, is, is scored. That's how the credit score is compulated based on those five things. And uh, this applies to every single person. Mm -hmm. Wow, I've got lots of notes here. Um, I have a quick question for you. So. Like you were saying, all right, let's say that you do have good credit. You go and you apply for a bunch of cards all at one time because you're really trying to buy new equipment, invest into your business, right? Yes. Um, so you get, let's say, uh, yeah, $5,000, you know, worth of, of credit. Um, and you want to go out and spend it all because, again, not just on like a car or this or that. But, but equipment, things that you can potentially turn into more money, you could be renting out, now you can produce other people, you can do other things, and you can pay that stuff on time and do all of that. Um, I mean, what would you recommend in a scenario like that? Would you recommend people just, hey, slowly buy the equipment that you need? Or is it okay if you did go all in, but make maybe larger payments back, have a good plan to get that back? What do you think? That's a really good question, Rachel. You always have great questions. <laughs> um, uh, so, you know, it's it's kind of the scale here, right? It, it really depends on, it depends. That's the answer. And what does it depend on? That The short answer is that it depends. The long answer is, you know, credit is the long game, right? We're planning as an entrepreneur. I see all entrepreneurs wanting to build long-term. Mm -hmm. So if you just get one card and you have $5,000 credit line, just go and spend it. Even though you're going to pay it right off, you've now offset that one slice of the pie, which is a big piece of the pie, which is the that we talked about, that 30% threshold that you now went above. You've exceeded and maxed out your entire credit line right at the moment when you were approved for credit. So now your score will drop significant, significantly 
the next month, even if you paid off all in full, because you've offset the algorithm by the amount of the credit limit that you used all at one time. Mm -hmm. So if you could do it incrementally, right? If you could buy a piece of equipment, paid off, buy another piece of equipment in a couple of days, paid off, and stay under that 30% under the, so if it's a $5,000 credit line, 30% would be 1,500 under the 1,500. Now, if one piece of equipment, let's say it's a keyboard, right? It's $2,000, you know, you need the keyboard. You can't buy three quarters of the keyboard and go back for the other quarter. So you buy <laughs> the keyboard or you try to find one that's under $1,500. And you might say, well, that's a little too much. Yeah, well, you're just starting in the credit game. You're just building your credit. It is too much. And you should think about these moves that you make. It's a chess match. You're playing against the credit bureaus. And you, yeah. right, for you to win that game, you have to follow the rules of the credit game. So mm -hmm. me personally- Or at least just know what you're getting into, that for the next yeah. few months, you might take your score down a little bit if it's that- It's not a little bit. It's going to drop. It's going to drop. It's going to be- so yeah. I had a, it's, when you said that I smiled because I had a case with a young lady yeah. similar to that. And what happened is her credit score, we started off with 730, which is an amazing credit score. Anything over 720 is considered exceptional. And the next month, her score dropped to 655. I remember this case. I remember the number, you know, mm -hmm. and she's like, what happened? So obviously we looked at her credit uh, report. We looked at her statements and we saw that she, she only had two credit cards. It was a total of eleven or twelve hundred dollars in credit, and she literally H and M, couple of other stores, Zara. I remember, <laughs> boom, 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 boom. She was like at a thousand ninety eleven hundred of the twelve hundred credit score. Yeah. She paid it all off, but it tanked her score. Mm -hmm. And then it was baby steps climbing back up. So at that, what did I advise her to do? I said, Hey, I'm glad you paid it off. Now every time you hit. The 30% threshold, pay off your balance, pay off your balance, pay off your balance. It took about four months to get her back up to over 700. And we never got her back over 730 yet. So you really? see what happened? Just that one decision took her down a, a really large sum. Yeah, about 85 points. Wow. Okay. So yes, if you know, if you know what you're getting into, but you need it, right? Because this is the equipment that's going to produce the music you need which potentially is going to sell a record for you and you're going to make X amount, then, hey, you got to do what you have to do, right? That's You're in business. And as long as you know you're going to make that payment, better than not making the payment and charging the card. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. But better to, yeah, slow it down yeah. a little bit. So um, we've got a whole business credit side of things to, yes. to talk about as yes. well. But I think we should maybe... Save that for our master class because I know even on the personal credit, there's probably a lot more to dig into. So we've been talking about actually having a program that y'all can sign up for because we know that this is a long-term game and we don't want you to be at it alone. We really want you to have that support. Um, so definitely stay tuned for that. Music Entrepreneur, Credit Victory, and Funding Victory, we've been talking as well of how we can start to really figure out what is available out there. We've got a number of resources already, but um, Roman definitely, you know, has been looking a lot into this, into this space to see what else um, can be available for you guys. So I think we're going to have to roll out a whole series around this, Roman. You're not going anywhere. Um, I'm not. I'm with you guys long term. Yeah. Um, but thank you for all of these tips. I hope all of you watching got, you know, some really good advice out of this. Um, I know, again, we've all had a, a hard year, so I'm sure there's a few people watching that haven't been able to make those payments, but don't worry, you're not alone. And also, you know, don't be afraid to tell people that, hey, I have made some bad decisions or I just didn't know what I didn't know. I mean, this is not stuff that we're taught in school. Nobody really teaches us about this financial literacy stuff. So you're not alone. Don't feel bad. We're all in this. Even the most successful people around you, probably a few of them have some crappy credit. So it's nothing to be ashamed of. And look, within six months to a year, you can be in a completely different place. Um, and look how you know quickly this last year has just flown by. So uh, you know, take that step. Roman, how can people get in touch with you or in touch with Credit Victory? Can they go apply? What's the next step? Sure. I want to add two things before I give you contact information that is super important. First yeah. of all, just like Rachel said, there is a lot of capital out there. 
outside of the banks, there's a lot of alternative funding options, realistic options that don't make you jump through all these hoops where it feels like you're applying for a mortgage, right? It's streamlined. We streamline it. We vetted these companies and these partnerships and these relationships. And like I said, we stand behind our motto that money makes sense, right? We're not going to put anyone into a program that just doesn't make sense for them. But we're going to explain to them what it is they're getting into so they understand. Because we're looking at the credit side, right, before we look at the funding side. Is this loan going to affect this individual negatively, right? Are they able to pay this based on their income? So that's super important. And the second thing I want to tell you is credit restoration for anyone that is dealing with negative or you know poor credit because they've either life happened to them or they made some poor decisions. Hey, I've been there. I can raise my hand and I do it all the time. It's nothing to be embarrassed about. Like Rachel said, the most embarrassing thing is not saying anything and staying in the same situation and not letting somebody help you. Right. You this is how, how, how I got here. And this is why I'm passionate about what I do. Right. We always tell people our motto. One of the mottos we have is uh, deleted, not defeated. Right. Bad credit could defeat you if you let it. But if you let us sit with you and explain to you that credit restoration is legal, there's stuff on your credit reports that most people don't even have a clue about that is legally by law. If a, a, we approach it in the right way, is allowed to be legally deleted because it shouldn't be on there in the first place because it's being reported inaccurately. But mm -hmm. there's a whole process to that. And but I'm just letting you know that there's hope and it's available and it's legal to do if you're aligning yourself with the right company. And I will tell you, we are the right company, right? We have heart. We're here to help. And, you know, we're proud to be part of Music Entrepreneur and to work side by side with Rachel and Jalen and everybody. And we want to help more music entrepreneurs truly become entrepreneurs and truly build a business. And that includes building their credit. So if somebody wants to get in touch with me, I'll make it super easy for you. So you don't have to jump through any hoops. You could email me directly, literally, and just say, you know, hey, heard you at Music Entrepreneur Conference. Roman, can I say the email, Rachel? Yeah. Yeah. Roman at creditvictory.com. Roman at creditvictory.com. Shoot me an email. Tell me your story. Tell me what your challenge is. It'll come to me directly. You don't have to feel uncomfortable. Someone who you don't know, right? And I will contact you directly. I'll put you in charge with one of our in touch with one of our credit specialists who'll reach out to you. If it's not me, and I promise you, we're gonna hold your hand, we're gonna answer your questions and really make you feel like, my goodness, you finally have a chance to get out of this dark hole. Wow, love it. Well, thanks again. You know, we were trying to keep this 20 minutes. Uh, we're at about 55, but- Credit can't ever be 20 minutes. <laughs> we thought we would be able to wrap this up in that. No, no way. We've got lots more coming, so stay tuned and talk to you soon. Thank you for the opportunity, Rachel and Jalen.